Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Newport. On tonight's panel, George Eustace, the UK Government's Secretary for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Labour's Economy Minister in the Welsh Government, a member of the Senate since 2011 and previously Health Minister, including for the first year of the pandemic, Vaughan Gething. Delith Jewell, Chair of the Welsh Language Society as a student at Oxford University, then a charity worker and a researcher for Plaid Cymru till her election to the Senate in 2019. Laura McAllister, Professor of Public Policy and Governance at Cardiff University, co-chair of the Independent Commission on the Constitution of Wales and a former international footballer and captain, and journalist, author of Broken Heartlands, A Journey Through Labour's Lost England and Whitehall editor at the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne. Welcome to my panel here. Welcome to our audience here in Newport. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. Thank you very much for joining us. Do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time, and we'll see what you've got to say. So, our first question tonight is from Gareth Tippins. Hi. Given the recent announcement in Parliament around ending self isolation for positive COVID cases, do you feel that this move is too soon, given that cases are still averaging around 70,000 a day? So, that's cases in the UK. Yeah. George, too soon? No, I think it's the, the right thing to do. The, the reality is that we've, we've had a plan now for the last year which has been based on getting very high levels of vaccination. We've now got around 37 million people who've had that booster jab. And although those infection rates, um, you know, peaked very sharply around Christmas and continued to rise for a few weeks after, they are now tapering down quite sharply. But crucially, the success of this vaccination programme, and we're one of the most successful countries in the world at getting that vaccine uh, rolled out, means that we, we've dramatically reduced the severity of infections and dramatically reduced the mortality associated with it. So it's the death rates that we're seeing um, are now, uh, you know, although it's a tragedy where you have those, they are obviously tapering down quite sharply. And, you know, at some point we've got to get back to um, living life normally and learning to live alongside COVID. And it may be that each year we're going to have to have possibly other booster jabs, uh, a bit like we do, for instance, on flu. But it does now feel that we're at the stage where um, we're, we're getting weaker strains of the variant. The success of the vaccine means it's the right time to do this. And what SAGE, which is the advisor, scientific advisory body that advises the government, says they've not given an opinion on this, they haven't been consulted on this. So where's the advice coming from for this decision? Well, look, the Prime Minister obviously has got the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer. So have they recommended on this? this? Well, they, they obviously it would have been discussed uh, with them, uh, yes, but we always uh, intended... To, so to so they've to... agreed to this, just to be clear? Well, um, I, I haven't... Um, I have, I, I pre... they, they would have actually given advice on this, yes, but the crucial thing is you only have to look at the data. And, and you know, we took a decision just before Christmas actually not to increase the levels of restrictions we had, even though at that point okay. infection rates were rising. And that's because we could see a lot of quite strong evidence, particularly from South Africa, that the severity of this strain was weaker and that the vaccines would be successful. And they have been. Um, right. And indeed, here in Wales now, uh, we're seeing a similar loosening of those restrictions. And that's the right thing to do, too. Delith, you're shaking your head. Yes, I am shaking my head because, I mean, well, for one thing, I think that it's quite obvious that George hasn't been told what this evidence is because, presumably, the evidence isn't actually there. It's published I totally, every day. I totally understand and feel empathy completely with the fact that people want to return to normality. Goodness me, I want to return to normality. It's been the worst two years of my life. But we need to make decisions motivated by facts. I think everyone can tell that this decision is not being made with the facts in mind. And really, I think it is quite distasteful that the Prime Minister is willing to imperil people's lives in order to save his own skin politically. <laughs> There's a few hands. Let's, let's Yes, the woman there in the, in the black and white top. I think it's not good enough to say, um, oh, I'm sure the, the Prime Minister would have talked to these people, you know, the health advisors. There's people who are very vulnerable and have been scared for many years. They need to feel confident that decisions that are made, they're going to be safe living their lives. It can't just be an off-the-cuff decision to get him out of trouble. It needs to be well thought through and people, to get the economy going, need to feel comfortable in doing that. All right. The woman there with the, with the glasses on her head, yeah. 
Uh, it's obviously purely political decision for Boris Johnson to make this announcement right now. Anybody who thinks it isn't a save his own skin exercise is a bit deluded. Um, and I think moving forward, when everybody says we ne need to learn to live with this, the emphasis should be on learn. And in Wales, I don't think we've learned any lessons at all. I lost my dad to hospital acquired COVID in January last year. Over a quarter of deaths in Wales from COVID are through hospital acquired COVID. There's been no investigations at all. Nothing has been learned. And in a latest infection report from a hospital in December, the same mistakes are being made over and over. In January, the mis uh, in the first wave, the mistakes were made, second and third wave. People have been too busy to have a proper review or inquiry. I joined uh, uh, the bereaved COVID Families for Justice, Cymru. We're calling on a Wales COVID inquiry. Everybody in Wales is behind it, except Welsh Labour, who made the decisions here in Wales. It's wrong, and we deserve answers. And as a country, we should be having this debate and talking about it, talking about everything. People suffering with long COVID now, businesses, we should be having that discussion, learning lessons and healing as a country. Bon. Well, I want to deal directly with the point about the Wales-only COVID inquiry. We want to have a UK inquiry that properly considers what has happened here in Wales, the choices we have made, including choices that I made as health minister, choices made by the first minister and Welsh government ministers, including the points about people acquiring COVID when they've been in hospital. Our ambition is not to have the truth hidden, but we want an inquiry that properly takes account of UK-wide choices that affected uh, the decisions that we made here in Wales. We're actually consulting... But what about the, the choices terms... that you made? I mean, you were health minister for some... Well, I'm, then... I'm fully expecting to, uh, to give evidence, to answer questions in any inquiry. I want, as indeed as a First Minister, an inquiry that properly considers what happens in Wales. It's not for Wales to be a footnote. And we're consulting on the terms of reference for the inquiry, and then there'll be a public consultation about that as well. And I've just gone through the exercise of the contaminated blood inquiry as well. Far too long until it happened, but actually there was... Uh, an honest attempt to get the truth from current and previous health ministers about choices that each of us had made at various points in time. When it comes back to the original question about whether now is the right time, I don't agree with George that this is the right time to ease those restrictions. And what we have tried to do is to be honest about the choices we've made, about the advice and the evidence upon which those choices are made. So when we update our measures tomorrow, We'll also be able to confirm we've consulted our chief medical officer and our scientific advisers. And I can tell you, before the Prime Minister went to give his preamble, uh, before Prime Minister's questions, no other significant announcement on COVID would have been done in that way. There wasn't a meeting between health ministers across the UK. There wasn't a meeting between chief medical officers across the UK. So our chief medical officer found out about it when the Prime Minister made those remarks in the House of Commons. That can't be the right way to run the response. What is still an emergency position. We're moving into better territory, yes, but we still need to consider our next steps to make sure we don't get this wrong, because there are still people who are coming to harm and losing their lives. That's why I don't share George's view. And does that satisfy you, that answer? No. With respect, we're waiting for the, to see the terms of the UK COVID inquiry, mm -hmm. uh, which Boris Johnson will sign off, and we're waiting to sort of give our opinion on it, when actually we could take control of decisions that we made in Wales, default decisions, and have a Wales COVID inquiry, okay. like they're having in Scotland. All right, let's hear a little bit more from the rest of the audience. Yes, the man here in the check shed. There's no manual that we could dig out the drawer when a pandemic started in this country. So what would Labour have done different? Well, we made those choices here in Wales. We did a number of things differently. We're still doing things differently now. For example, there's plainly a much higher risk appetite in the UK government. They're prepared to take more risk in the balance of direct harm from COVID. And they've shown that on a number of occasions. I can also tell you we really have made choices that have been supported by the science and the public health advice we've received. And we've published that. One of the early choices I made as Health Minister was to regularly publish a summary of the scientific advice we've received and the public health advice from our Chief Medical Officer as well. Okay. So, yes, we would have done things differently. At a UK level, we could have expected more support, for example, in the last phase, where we didn't get further support 
because the UK Treasury only acted when England had a need, not when other parts of the UK had right. a need to follow that public health I'm going to get round the rest of the panel. Sebastian. I think, first of all, everyone in the audience would agree that whatever happens, it should be based on scientific data, that nothing should be done for political reasons. And I'm a little bit sceptical at the announcement Boris Johnson made in the House of Commons, because he actually didn't say, we're going to do this. He announced, we're going to have a review for one week, and then we're going to announce. But by sort of pre-announcing it, it was speaking to a difficult political mood at that political time, shall we say. My general view is that, you know, we have gone through this awful two years, as you were just saying, for this country, and we are going to have to move gradually, slowly and easily back to some kind of new normality. And, you know, the government in Wales and the rest of the UK has taken huge impositions out of our lives. And I don't think that lockdowns and very coercive restrictions should become a, a general part of the public health playbook going forward in the future. You're right, there is no manual from a drawer you can pull out here, but we're learning all the time. And if you look at the decision that was made in England not to introduce those Plan B measures, I think that's widely seen as being vindicated, um, whereas obviously other parts of the UK took a different approach there. So we should always remember that, that we do have to gradually move out of this, but the idea that, you know, when all these regulations get pulled back, people don't have to isolate if they're ill at home, I don't have a problem with that, and I think most people will do it anyway. But again, that's the difference, moving away from the government telling people exactly what you have to do all the time to people taking responsibility for how they interact with this disease. So I want to see the evidence. I think we need to see what SAGE has okay. to say about this. And if it's backed up by the evidence, then that's the right thing to do. But if it's not, then we should wait. Laura. Well, clearly there's no manual and nobody expects there to be, but there are two really important principles that I think any government should follow dealing with a unprecedented crisis like COVID. One, to do no harm to its citizens, absolutely fundamental, and two, to follow data, evidence and science. And not to, uh, not to abandon experts when it's convenient to abandon experts. That's a hugely dangerous strategy and it undermines some of the most fundamental principles of, of good public policy. The problem we have, of course, at the moment is that trust in politicians generally, but trust in the Prime Minister is completely shattered. We know from all the data from opinion polling that even half of Conservative voters disapprove of the Prime Minister currently. But let's not let the Welsh Government get off the hook entirely either, because if we look, and I'll come back to the point about a, a Welsh inquiry, I wrote about that myself um, uh, 18 months ago, but let's not let the Welsh Government be let off the hook completely here, because if you look at outcomes in Wales, despite differences in policy, outcomes in Wales are broadly similar to Scotland and to Wales. What has been done differently in Wales to is Scotland a banking England, up of yeah. trust <coughs> and respect. And that's come, I think, from, in fairness to the First Minister, following the evidence carefully, communicating well in a paced way, and therefore the trust that the Welsh people have in the First Minister stands at around 5.2 out of 10, compared to around 3.2 for, uh, for Boris Johnson. Coming on to your point about a Welsh inquiry, I think it is unforgivable not to be pushing quicker, faster, sooner for a Welsh inquiry. Because if we are a mature political society with our own government, it's all very well celebrating successes and, and criticising governments across the border, but we need to get our own house in order, we need to be challenging with ourselves, we need to be self-critical, and we should have launched an inquiry when there was an opportunity, probably 12 months ago, but of course we had a Senate election at that time, and it was unlikely to happen, but, but nearly a year has gone since then. OK, I'm going to move on and take another question. Before I do, I just want to tell you that next week we will be in Leeds and the week after that we'll be in Harris. So if you'd like to come and be part of our audience, do, code, do go to the Question Time website. You can follow the instructions there and come and be part of the programme. So that's Leeds and in Harrow. We'd love to see you. OK, let's take another question now from Stella Cosgrove. Are the problems in the Met Police much deeper than Cressida Dick's leadership? So Cressida Dick, the head of the Met, has uh, resigned... She's quit. I mean, just hours after she'd said in a radio interview that she had no intention of going, uh, but she's issued a statement saying she feels she had no choice after a conversation with the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Sebastian, are the problems with the Met much deeper than Cressida Dick? They certainly are, and I think this should be a moment to have a conversation about whether it's time to break up the Met Police, that it's too big, it's got too many responsibilities, and it's this weird hybrid of London's police force, but also a national police force as well, and I think 
the reason that Cressa Dick has gone. I think, by the way, it's <coughs> right that she has gone because she's lost the confidence of very senior politicians, but also I think the general public, if you think back to what happened with the Sarah Everard case as well. I have dozens of female friends who still don't feel safe in London, still don't feel they can walk the streets at night and have still not been reassured that the Met is serious about reform. But you look at all the scandals the force has had in recent years. You've got the, the messages at Charing Cross Police Station, absolutely appalling sexism there. You've got the, invest, the botched investigation into the Downing Street parties, the murder of Daniel Morgan, Operation Midland into the Carl Beach accusations. The Met is just clearly not fit for purpose in any way. And I think Cresta Dick tried to put forward a plan to um, renew it and in, but just did not have a grasp of the situation. I think personally, many of her comments to the public have been quite tone deaf. They haven't spoken to that need of change within the organisation. So I think that this should be a moment that national policing should be in a separate organisation, perhaps something attached to the Home Office, and the Met has to focus on winning back the confidence and trust of all Londoners. Man here at the front. Has Boris Johnson used the Metropolitan Police Inquiry to buy himself more time? OK, uh, so we may get on to that, but let's focus on Cressida Dick just for a minute, because that was a question. Uh, yes, a man there in the black jacket. The culture within the Met Police is very bad. Um, it's riven with homophobia, it's riven with misogy misogyny. Um, the coroner at the inquest into the Stephen Port murders said that the investigation was beyond negligible. And yet five of those officers have gone on to be promoted, even though they were in the investigation. So it needs to be a, a root and branch restructure of the Mets to get rid of the culture. And are you confident that that can happen? It may be now that Cressida Dick has gone, but I think it needs to be someone who's independent not somebody from within the force to do it, but it needs to be an independent panel that does it. All right. The woman at the back there, yes. Um, I think the issue around misogyny and policing is not restricted just to the Metropolitan Police. Mm. And while I think the decision of Cressida Dick to go is right, I think the police are us and we are the police, and misogynistic police reflect a misogynistic society... And the problem is deeper than that. The problem is around um, women's rights being pushed back generally. And it's particularly focused around the police because of the power that police have that other individuals and citizens don't have. And I think there are problems in Gwent Police with misogyny. There are problems in South Wales Police with misogyny about the way domestic violence is handled. So I think it's not just about the Met who have particular high-profile problems. It's about policing. Vaughan. Yeah, look, I, I think it's... Crescent and exposition was untenable, I think. Um, the range of issues that... that I mean, she Sebastian was, only, she was only approved to stay on for a further years as recently as September. Yeah, and yet, actually, I thought that was a pretty extraordinary decision at the time, in any event, and that's more about the inability to agree on wanting a different candidate, a different person to lead. Uh, I, I agree with Sebastian. I think her comments recently have been utterly tone-deaf on a range of issues. Uh, and there's something to recognise here. There are many good, decent people who work in policing who really do want to serve the public and do the right thing, and they're let down by their colleagues who don't share those values and live them in the job they do, and by the leadership not demanding that of their organisation. It is possible, of course, for the Met to improve and be better, but it needs a leadership that is committed to do that, a change of the culture. And I think the, the last member of the audience who spoke is right. There are problems in the Met, but there are problems in every police force. And is there enough honesty to recognise there are problems in those forces? And are there leaders prepared to recognise that and then do something about it with all those good, decent people who work in policing right around the country? Sure. Well, but the problem with all of this is that power is seductive. And as, as the lady mentioned a moment ago, the police is not a unique institution. If you take academia, if you take politics, if you take sport, most of those organisations are run by white men. They're run by white men of a certain age, of a certain cultural background and a certain outlook. Now, white men have a place in governance, but they don't own governance of all our institutions. And we've got an enormous amount of work to do to diversify our organ organisations on every index, but we need to take it seriously. The but, Laura, are you, saying, are you saying that the kind of comments that were seen, for example, in the, in the, the messages at Charing Cross Police Station, for example, where... I mean... Uh, I hesitate to repeat it because it is so offensive. 
Mm. But one officer wrote, my dad kidnapped some African children and used them to make dog food. Mm. Mm. Would you, surely when you say you get, there are problems in the Met, as there is in academia, well, you wouldn't expect comments like that in academia, well, well, would you? Or would you say well, people probably horrendous. think that kind of they're thing horrendous. there too? But there is inbuilt sexism in every structure and in every institution. And this not, is, not is racism. Just, not just about. racism, homophobia, in every institution in the world. Look at the Australian Parliament. The Speaker of the Australian Parliament has admitted that there is there has been a number of incidents of sexual abuse and attacks within the parliament. And I think we, we skate over this lightly at our peril because we are not seeing the kind of structural change and diversification of our institutions to make them properly attuned to the population. And until we do that, appointing a new Metropolitan Police Commissioner will not solve these much deeper cultural issues. Oh. But isn't so, this the point, though, that the Met is a leadership organisation here for the whole country? And I think you're completely right about those awful other trends that exist. But I think when you look at the Met here, yes, it needs new leadership and it's going to get... And I think I would agree with some of the audience that they may look outside the organisation or maybe even abroad to try and bring in a fresh pair of eyes to this. But I think you've got to look at the very specific things and there are just clear trends across the whole police force that leadership is failing. And the fact that Cresta Dick stayed in that role long ago, and I think everyone would agree she probably should have left, shows that there is a much deeper problem here about the, the structure of that force. Yes, the woman here. I think we're dealing here with a root problem. So it's not just at the higher level. We need to deal with this problem much earlier. I've been a teacher for quite a while. And the things I've been witness to at schools coming from students, even young ones. Like what? So, so some would just, for instance, a favorite saying of some of the students is, oh, you're gay, for instance. And they would as a term oh, she, of abuse, obviously. Mm. Yes, if or that's how they're saying it. she's just a girl. And it, it's it's a part of our society, regrettably, and we need to deal with it really, really early on, and make it part of our society to educate young people and children not to use these things, not to make use of the old ways. And the woman behind you. Further to um, her point, what strategies have the governments got to address these problems and create more diversity and acceptance and general well-being within institutions like the police force or the NHS or academia or politics? What are you going to do to make sure that people are represented and it's not just white, straight, perhaps middle-class men of a certain age from a certain background? What are you going to do about it, George? Well, of course, Cressida Dick's not a, not a white man, and, so, and there's a lot of effort going in to broaden the diversity uh, of our police force. But I think on this particular case, the question was whether the problem goes deeper than Cressida Dick. And, you know, the question really is whether she was the right one to sort out what have been, you know, a series of problems. Um, so it's not, it's not even to say that she's sort of complicit in this in any way. Obviously, she's been doing, uh, using her best endeavours to try to do this. But she's lost the confidence of the mayor to be able to do that. We've had the Everard case. Has she case. lost the confidence of the government? Well, look, there's been a number of uh, things over, over a period of time, but she, um, she was committed to trying to sort out these problems. I don't doubt her sincerity in that. Was she right to resign, do you think, today? Well, I think... Um, look, re the reality is that if she hadn't got the confidence of, of the London mayor, and, and Sadiq Khan has, has made this clear now over uh, you know, a, number of, uh, a number of weeks that he uh, wanted to talk to her about this and was uh, asking for some clarity on things, and he's uh, taken a view today that he didn't have that confidence. You know, our view was that she was committed to trying to sort this uh, out, and it was right to give her the space to do that. And but so I do think... you wish she'd stayed? No, no, I think in, in, in light of the problems they've had, particularly with uh, those revelations around Charing Cross, which comes on top, as a number of others have said, uh, of, of many other issues. You know, you probably do need somebody different to try to sort this out. So she was right to go today? Yes. But isn't it strange yeah. that um, the Home Secretary didn't see fit to give her less time then? The Mayor of London did. I mean, how, many time, how much time do you need to sort out a whole series of pretty awful disasters that we've outlined here? Isn't it strange that it took the Mayor of London to make that decision? Well, look, uh, the Home Secretary has obviously been um, talking to her and working with her closely about the plans that she had to sort out these issues. And I simply say, you know, it is, it is obviously... You know, she's given 40 years' uh, service. She has been trying to sort these problems out. I think the truth is there's been now a catalogue of 
uh, different issues. And it probably does need a change of leadership to be able to uh, resolve this issue. But, you know, I think you should also, along the way with this, recognise that, you know, she was using her best endeavours and trying to sort this problem out. But in the end, it's just become too much for her. Dan? I just think it's extraordinary that it's taken <laughs> until now for this to happen. If we're thinking of Cresta Dick uh, and her tenure, recently at least, with the Met, Two images seem to loom large because you know we're, we're visual, aren't we, in terms of how we think about things often. The photograph, which has come to stand for so many of these parties uh, that had been happening during lockdown in number 10, uh, and then set against that photograph, the photograph of the woman in the Sarah Everard um, vigil being forced to the ground. There are two duties, surely, that the police have to, or, or two duties they have to uphold. One is to hold the people who break the law to account, and the other one is to protect the public. Now, both of those images show that the Met was failing in both of these ways. And I think that her position had become completely untenable. That had happened a long time ago. It was a complete lack of leadership that it had to come to this. Let's take another question now from Josh Packford. Does the panel think the Prime Minister should make a formal apology to Keir Starmer after the remarks he made in Parliament? So let's just remind ourselves exactly what Boris Johnson did say in Parliament. He called Starmer a former director of public prosecutions who spent more time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. He then issued a clarification later on. Vaughan, yes, should he apologise? Of course he should. And... It's part of the playbook of this Prime Minister that he's made the remarks he made and he hasn't. Boris Johnson is many things, but stupid isn't one of them. He knew when he made those direct and personal remarks that there would be a reaction. He almost certainly knew that they weren't true either. And the clarification wasn't really a clarification. It was a dishonest version of what he'd said. Because if you listen to what he said and how he said it, and remember the context was that he had just apologised for more failings and the party's investigations, it was plainly an attempt to distract. Now, the people who surrounded Keir Starmer outside Parliament, they are, of course, responsible for their own conduct. But two things can be true at the same time. The Prime Minister has equally got a share of responsibility for stoking up conspiracy theories peddled by violent racists and fascists on the internet. And that's what a Prime Minister of the United Kingdom did. What the Prime Minister says matters. And for me, I think it really reflects and hardens the impression that many members of the public have that this Prime Minister has a prolifically unfaithful relationship with the truth. It goes into this and so many other things, including, of course, Partygate. Sebastian? Absolutely. I think there's no doubt he should resign... Um, sorry, no, no, he should resign. He <laughs> <to> apologise. <laughs> Do you think he should resign as well? <laughs> Um, I think on the Prime Minister's um, position, obviously, because we go back to the Met point earlier, we've got criminal inquiries, and I think those inquiries will clarify fully has he broken the law and has he misled Parliament. If he's done either of those things, his position is untenable. But we've got those inquiries and we see where they go. On the Jimmy Savile thing, I think there's absolutely no doubt he should apologise fully within public. I've encountered that mob myself outside Parliament and um, they've spotted me and chased me down the street until I hopped into a black cab. But what we saw with Keir Starmer was just not acceptable in our political debate. And I think he said himself the fact that he had not been shouted certain terms at him. I think protecting paedophiles was one of them. Mm. And I think, as Vaughan said, that is probably clearly linked to the Prime Minister's position there. And things do get said in the heat of parliamentary debate, but I just think that is not one of them. And he still hasn't fully apologised. And I think for the good of the, for the government, for our country, but also just the office of Prime Minister, there's no question about what he should do. George. Well, look, the attacks that we saw on Keir Starmer from that uh, group of protesters were, you know, completely unacceptable. The Prime Minister's condemned that. Uh, we all condemn that. But I think um, those who are trying to make the link with this Jimmy Savile uh, comment, uh, you know, are, are wrong. These were anti-vax campa campaigners, the same sorts of people, actually, that uh, chased a BBC journalist, Nick Watt, down the street the other day, the same sorts of people uh, who accosted Michael Gove as well in a similar circumstance. They shouted things like Julian Assange, shouted that he was a traitor. Um, these were people who were against lockdown measures and against um, the, the vaccination <coughs> programme that we've been rolling out. And if one of them mentioned um, you know, Jimmy Savile, which I think is the allegation, that's, that doesn't mean that that was the reason 
for this particular attack. It was a lot more can than one condemn it and, and not confuse it. I mean, it, it, paedophile protector was another thing that Starmer said he'd not heard before. I mean, he's made the link to the comments made uh, by the Prime he, Minister. Is he wrong in that? Well, he, he will obviously want to make that, uh, you know, that, poli that particular political point. I can understand that as a leader of the opposition. That's oh, what that's he would really, do. That's, I, I, really, I, I that's really, really, really poor, that's poor. No, no, that's but really I don't think poor. it is right to make uh, this particular connection when we've all condemned those uh, scenes with uh, Keir Starmer, and, and when many people... Well, should Boris Johnson apologise? That's the question. Should well, he apologise? he's apologized? clarified what he said. Yeah, but I, he's clarified. Well, should he make a formal uh, apology? That's the question from Well, John. I have a bit more sympathy for him, because I was in that statement when these comments were made. It was incredibly heated. People were shouting all sorts of abuse at him, um, uh, you know, levelling all sorts of accusations uh, against him. Indeed, the, the Speaker, in the end, pulled everybody up on the use of sort of intemperate, uh, you know, non-parliamentary language. It was a, a highly charged, uh, highly emotive session. And, um, you know, people say things at the, the heat of the, the moment. There was a George, it was remark. a lie. It, 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 it was, I'm sorry, I think that the defence that the UK government has on this is just so utterly inadequate. Either the government has fundamentally misunderstood the level of public anger about this, or they don't care. Either way, they're taking all of us for fools. Well, that's not right. He clarified what he meant, as I said. And it was, it was about the fact that Keir Starmer was in that leadership position when this episode happened. But, but he's but also now explained well, that's, subsequently that's that's that he knows that Keir Starmer was not directly involved in that decision. But, but, but the nuances, of language, nuances of language are vital, aren't they? And that the trust that the contract that politicians have with the public and with the electorate is based on use of language and trust and respect. And whilst... You, you know, you're, you're skating around something there, George. The truth of the matter was that was a lie. That wasn't true. And if anything, a, f a simple apology would not help a great deal. And we know it probably won't come, but it might do something to try and assuage the levels of distrust that the public have at the moment in the office of Prime Minister. And I think anybody who believes in democracy, wherever that is, should be severely concerned at that state of play. It wasn't just that this was a planned remark, though, George. It wasn't just that it was an obnoxious slur to Director Keir Starmer. It's also the fact that the victims of Jimmy Savile weren't given any thought at all, either at the time or subsequently. Why is it so difficult just to say sorry for something that is plainly wrong? I'd expect it from my seven-year-old when he gets things wrong. Uh, why on earth can't we expect at least the same from the Prime Minister? There's a lot of hands up. Let's hear from some of you. Uh, yes, the, the man here in the front. Thank you. I find it incredible that a man of such disdain and, and lack of empathy for the people of this country is still in power. Um, but the biggest concern I have is, is what does a man that lies, as our Prime Minister, as an example set for our children? Laura, you mentioned young people there. Sorry, Vaughan, you did. Mm. It's incredible that that person is in power and our children see a man lie in and expect to be guided by that. Yeah, and, and, right. and, and, oh, if I may. Uh, just quickly. Yes, yeah. words have consequences. Mm. This is going to have a consequence far beyond the career of the Prime Minister or indeed the safety of any individual politician. It erodes public trust in democracy. It dulls down any sense of connectedness between the people and politics. And that has, I mean, that's a frightening prospect. The reason he won't apologise is that he knew from the start that it was a lie. It's why he did it. Right, let's, the man behind you, yes, in the green shirt. Um, I feel like with Keir Starmer's speech before um, he spoke, of, uh, before Boris Johnson made that claim um, about Jimmy Savile was so inspiring for a lot of people in Britain. They heard about the public good, what Keir Starmer said, about all the sacrifices the British public had made. And for Boris Johnson to come back with a very slanderous claim, to be angry, clearly angry, and then try and move on, it's a diversion tactic. It's a constant diversion tactic to be able to take away from some terrible thing, many terrible things that have happened um, over the past two years, and I think it's a huge disgrace that he's able to get away with this. It's really woman, sad. The woman at the very back. Um, you can say as much as you like that it's anti-vax protesters that were outside um, that day, but the Prime Minister should know that his comments will directly be used, you know, anything will, it will sort of inflame these people. So to just say, well, you know, it, it's not down to him, He's absolutely using inflammatory comments and he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. We can't talk about him like he is a child, he is a grown adult, he's supposed to be the leader of this country and his behaviour is just not acceptable. He absolutely should apologise. And here absolutely. in the... In the yeah, with the blonde hair. I think recent incidents have shown that it's already unsafe for politicians on the street 
So I think the Prime Minister should be more aware how comments can affect everything, and I think he should apologise. So, George, I'm going to come back to you. I mean, when you hear that, what do you think? Do you think, well, they're all wrong? Well, look, uh, as I say, I, uh, uh, you know, was in that particular statement and there was a lot of anger on all sides and people were saying, you know, a lot of things. It was a very heated, uh, you know, highly fueled session. And so I've got a bit more sympathy for the Prime Minister than others here uh, will have. Um, and he has clarified what he, what he meant. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, he's given that explanation. Um, he's, he's, you know, he's made clear in that clarification that he's not saying that Keir Starmer was directly involved uh, in that particular case. He's made that explicit. And he's pointed out that the point he was making is that he was in a, a leadership role in the organisation. And, you know, bear in mind, this was, you know, at a point when Keir Starmer was saying, well, whatever happened, whether he knew it or not, the Prime Minister was in a leadership position, so he should have been responsible for everything that was happening in, uh, in 10 Downing Street, whether anyway, he knew about it or not. Thing, so the difference being, obviously, that the was at some of these he's events, as we know. sort of, you know, comparable point that he was uh, attempting to make. He's clarified that. The, OK. The, this issue on where this came from, though, because you mentioned <laughs> that uh, this was obviously an anti-vax mob and they were anti-lockdown. They've been in Westminster for months, if not years now. This unfounded allegation about Jimmy Savile came from some of the darkest corners mm. of the internet. And this is a conspiracy theory. And I think we cannot get into a situation where people are standing in the House of Commons putting conspiracy theories out because the Speaker of the House said the, it's an echo chamber. It goes from there, social media, and out into the country. So I think we have to be very clear on when things are said there, that they are truthful and that they are based in reality, not the dark corners of the internet. All right, I'm going to take another question from Simon. Simon Phillips. Uh, footballers are perceived as role models. Does Kurt Zuma deserve to play for such a big club as West Ham? So Kurt Zuma was filmed kicking and slapping his cat. Um, pretty disturbing to see. I mean, he, he then went on to play um, for West Ham uh, on, that, on the Tuesday night uh, against Watford. Um, do you think he should have played? Do you think he should continue to play for West Ham? I think with the council culture that already exists, I don't think he will. And me personally, I don't think he should be on that platform. I think he does deserve to be held accountable for what he's done. Do yeah, he... I, think he sh I think he should lose his, lose his position with the club, yeah. Well, Laura, I want to come to you, obviously, as former international football captain. What's your perspective on this? Well, I, th I think there are a couple of things here. I don't think it has anything to do with cancel culture, by the way. Mm. I think it has a lot to do with pretty horrendous, brutal behaviour of towards a small animal. And anyone who can treat a small animal in that way could probably treat a small child in that way. So I think it's, it's a dreadful, dreadful thing. I think West Ham and David Moyes, the manager, made a pretty horrendous mistake in starting Kurt Zuma in the match on Tuesday evening. And the kind of... And can I just say, because David Moyes said... I mean, he said he's a pet lover, he's not endorsing those scenes at all, but he said he played in and the video had no impact on his decision because he said he's one of our better players. Well, well, that was going to be the point I come on to. Football cannot see itself as some kind of exclusive preserve removed from the rest of society. Football is part of society. The people who go to watch football, mm. the people who play football are part of society. Trying to create some exceptionalism around the game, is, it helps no one whatsoever. He's a poor role model, to, to be polite. Um, he, his, the response from the fans gave you a pretty in, clear indication of what they thought of it. Um, and by the way, some people, of course, have waded into this debate and said, you know, is what Kurt Zuma uh, has done, is that worse than some horrendous other things in football, like racism, sexism mm. and homophobia? That misses the point, because all of those things require real, serious mm. address too. And the fines that some of the players who've been guilty of sexual assault, for example, or racism, have been far, far too lenient. But let's not get those issues confused with this issue about Kurt Zuma, which is pretty heinous and pretty horrible. Mm. And the back in the, in the green jacket. I agree with, with what the panel was saying regarding um, Kurt Zuma. And I just... I'm a bit worried that we're, we're realising these aspects or this, this um, set of abuse on animals now when we have, like, shootings of, of birds up in the north as, as sports or classified as sports, or you have um, horse racing as well. So we should... We, we would have... We've, we've been seeing these things time and time again. So, hang on, just to be clear, so are you equating horse racing with, with kicking and slapping a pet? 
Well, in terms of the horse racing, so the process of, of obviously doing that race itself, that, that can be classed because you're using a whip on a horse. I, I, I think... For a limited number of for times. For a limited yeah. number of... Yeah, but that could be classified as well. So I'm, I'm not condoning on what Kurt Zuma has done. OK. But I'm just saying it's funny how, obviously, this has been... This is blown now out of proportion or blown out of pr proportion. It depends on how we perceive it when this has been happening all through for years and years under our noses. OK, the man there in the very colourful shirt. Uh, no one mentioned about the child. <clears> There's <throat> a child involved, and he's been mm. taught. Yeah. I mean, it's probably more important than the, the animals, but... <clears throat> so this, I think, was Kurt Zuma's child, who was, who was in the there in, in, in the kitchen at, at the yeah. time when this was going on. Yes, the man here in the front, the blue shirt. Are we reaching a point now in society where we can't call footballers role models anymore? <clears throat> George? Well, I think the, these were um, shocking scenes that he posted uh, uh, online. I know that the RSPCA have already been uh, investigating this. I think that the two cats that he had uh, have now been taken away from him. And the RSPCA will also be working very closely with the police because, you know, this might well be, uh, you know, a clear breach of the Animal Welfare Act. And one of the things, um, you know, that I've done in my time uh, in DEFRA is to actually increase the sentencing for, you know, egregious uh, animal cruelty to, to five years. It used to be just a, a six-month maximum penalty. Uh, we do get, sadly, um, some terrible cases of uh, cruelty to animals. We've increased the sentences. But, look, um, you know, there are laws there, and rather than necessarily worrying about whether uh, he's still employed by the club or not, I understand the, the issue Would you think fine. he should still be playing for the club? That's the question. Well, uh, that was a question. I mean, my view is that, um, that, if he's, that if he's broken the law and there, there will be an investigation uh, on this by the RSPCA working with the police, you know, then there might even be grounds for, you know, for a prosecution. And I know that's something they'll be looking at. It's too early to uh, say at this stage. Uh, you know, but that's perhaps what we should be thinking about rather than uh, worrying about what club or other he might play for. Dan. I, I think that we, we have to hold people in public life to a higher standard. And um, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about, in, in another context, about how we need to, to look at how we are educating children about equality, about what is right and what is wrong. So, so often with football, uh, people do look towards footballers and, and so many sports people as role models. I mean, we've seen in Wales, Gareth Bale, so many of our fantastic squad here, but equally the, in, in England as well, the England football team um, last year had, be, had really got, I know, a real sense of national pride, just like we in Wales feel in the Welsh team. It's a lens through which we see society at its best, but also, I think, society at its worst. And when this happens, we have to, there have to be consequences because there will be so many children who will be seeing what happened. And, it's, and if there's no consequence, then they'll think, oh, well, you know, that must be a normal way to behave. It, 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 it's, it can have really dire consequences, I think. So should he be dropped from the club? That's the question. I think so. Go on. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think back to the image people remember of the woman who kick slapped and punched a horse. She lost a job. She's a teacher, I think. She was. She lost her job. Um, and she was suspended while there was an investigation. But we've if, had, if, we've if had other players who've <laughs> not lost their job. So, who, for example, have been... And this is what you're talking about, Laura, who um, were found to have, have made racist remarks. I'm thinking of John Terry, Mrs Wild back now, and then, and then Suarez. And they had match bans, but then they carried on. Yeah, well, my, my view is that the game needs to recognise the problems that it's got. Because footballers are role models. People do take cues from what those people do, and be good and bad. If you think about the England football team that Dallas mentioned, I think they're a real credit to the game um, in the way they conducted themselves in the recent tournament, and they deserve better fans, better behaviour than we saw at some of those England games. And you've got the Welsh football team, actually the Welsh men's football team, um, again, I think they're really positive role models. And football fans in Wales, the reputation has changed significantly. It wasn't that long ago we were embarrassed about our fans, the way they behaved towards each other following international sides. That's changed. The players have changed, the game is changing in a way that is really positive and makes us all proud. And if you look at other fields of life, other employees who do that sort of thing get suspended, they get disciplined, and you don't want people to say, well, you're one of my best employees, so it doesn't matter what you've done outside. And I do agree with the, the gentleman from the audience. One of the most disturbing things I thought wasn't just the cruelty and the potential for criminal offences, 
it was done and filmed in front of a child. Mm. Uh, and I think that sets a terrible example. Someone who did that wouldn't be allowed to come into work in one of our schools, and yet there are someone who's going to be adored or criticised by people watching games. And like I say, Laura's right, the game has more problems than this. You know, David Goodwillie recently as well. There are really big problems at football and needs to recognise it's part of the country and needs to reflect the values we all want to live by. Sebastian. I would just agree with that. And I say, you get to the point, Vaughan, that this is not really for me about role models. This is basic human decency mm -hmm. and behaviour and the kind of mind who would not just treat an animal like that, but would film it and mm -hmm. post it what kind of person should be in any position where they're public facing if that is how they think and that's how they perceive animals here? So I think, for me, footballers are role models. There's no way out of that because they are some of the most prominent people in the country. And I think if you look back to the England squad in the Euros and how that symbolised a big moment for the country, I think that was very impressive. But I think in this instance, it just has to be about someone like that. I don't see why they really have a place in public discourse. Just one very small point about the racism uh, issue, which has come up in connection with this. I think there's been a, a misunderstanding that racism in football is about speech and about abuse, uh, verbal abuse, but it's much deeper than that. There have been cases of, of racist assaults and so on, and that's why people are getting the two issues slightly confused. We should be consistent in our treatment of all of these matters because all of them are a huge stain on our, our incredibly beautiful game. Mm. OK. Let's take a final question. We've just about got time for it from Judith. Judith Richards. Hi. What immediate opportunities does the newly appointed uh, Brexit Opportunities Minister see for South Wales? So you're talking about Jacob Rees-Mogg, of am. course, yes. who has appealed in the paper today for ideas, uh, for a kind of bonfire of red tape uh, brought about by the EU. Um, Dennis. Yeah. Brexit opportunities or Brexit opportunist. I mean, the, the point has been made, it's not my point, I, I saw it online, that this is possibly the only job so far that has actually been created by Brexit as it was a result of Brexit. I mean, I think it says an awful lot that there have been six years now uh, since the referendum and yet Jacob rees had to write in a newspaper asking people, OK, so what do you think the opportunities are then? I mean, there are so many ways in which we in Wales have already found out that because of, not necessarily because of Brexit, but because of the very specific Brexit that the, the Tory party has decided to follow, we are going to be a billion pounds worse off over the next three years than we would have been had we been under the EU. Again, this is very specifically because of the red, white and blue Brexit, the, the, you know, all of the getting rid of the red tape, but actually it's created more red tape. I mean, I, I think that we are fundamentally at a crossroads in terms of where, where we're heading with all of this. But Jacob rees I mean, how, talk about an oxymoronic title, Brexit Opportunities. <laughs> Gosh. Laura. Well, I, it's hard to think of many opportunities at the moment from Brexit, but in fairness, you know, we've been so caught up with COVID and management of that crisis that, you know, that, that we haven't had a decent approach to considering this. But you take the issue of funding, because, you, you know, whatever you think about the EU, areas like this and areas north of this were hugely dependent on European structural investment. And yet we had the government announcing what is, in essence, a compensation for us losing that um, in terms of the levelling up fund last week. But when you look at the figures for that, um, and when you d delve a little bit deeper into the programmes relating to that, no programmes were awarded in any of the areas around here, in Newport, in Blaine Gwent, in Caffili, uh, in Torvine. No projects were funded through that, despite European projects having been really invested in those areas. Around half of the total amount that was given through European aid is now coming to Wales um, through the levelling up fund. Even worse, in my opinion, is the threat to the democratic accountability of that, because Vaughan will have more to say on this than me, but the Welsh Government and the Senate has been completely bypassed in the organisation of levelling up. There needs to be a respect agenda, whatever happens with Brexit. We can't just have a UK government ignoring a democratically elected government in Wales and when it suits it. Because the people of Wales, for right or wrong, have elected Vaughan and his colleagues and they have a right to be treated with respect and honour and participation in any funding programme. Okay. Let's hear from a couple of the audience. The woman there in the black top. Thank you. Brexit is simply crippling industry in the UK. I live it every day of my job. What does the government... What, and what is your job? I work in manufacturing. Mm. So I work in Bristol in uh, wine manufacturing. And 
every single day, whether it's delays, paperwork, fees, you name it, every single day there are issues. And I, we get no help from anyone, whether it's Wales or England, on how to manage it. Companies are going bust, small companies who don't have teams that can look at this sort of thing. We're at a loss. We're an absolute loss. How do we deal with it? George, how does she deal with it? Look, the, the crucial thing that we've, we've gained by leaving the EU is, is just that regulatory freedom to be able to, to make laws that work for us. And we so have, why do you think everyone's, true. Look, why uh, is everyone I, laughing at that, I, George, do you think? What, what, what do you think that response well, means? Well, uh, look, I've worked in uh, DEFRA, the department, for around eight years. Uh, both when we were in the EU and since we've left. And the truth is that around 80% of all of the laws that we were responsible for were handed down from Brussels. And it was all about trying to avoid this or that piece of litigation, utterly stifling, completely unable uh, to, to pursue creative policy. So and what do you really say directly changed. to the woman there, George? Because, I mean, it's a point of question time. You have people here and they put their points to you. She is saying that it's, it's just crippling her business in terms of paperwork, shortages you mentioned as well. Well, look, if it's it comes, um, <laughs> so there, there is, as, we, as a result of, of coming out, yes, of the single market and coming out of the customs union, which gives us the freedom to, to do trade deals with other countries around the world, to gain a seat at the table in international negotiations in that way. Uh, yes, it does mean that there are customs declarations that have to take place. But, you know, companies that trade around the world do those declarations anyway for countries around the world. The world's much larger than the European Union. It does mean that some companies that are heavily reliant on exports to the EU, yes, will have to fill out a, a customs declaration. But, you know, the, the evidence is that they're actually uh, getting used to that. So if you look at the Scottish salmon industry, for instance, uh, their exports have actually increased since we've uh, left the European Union, despite the fact they've got them some extra admin. But the real prize is, is that regulatory freedom. I'm seeing it in all of our areas. Wales will have uh, more power than it's ever had through being in the EU because the devolution settlement means that many of the powers we've taken back from Brussels uh, will go straight to the devolved administrations and they'll have far greater freedom than they ever had as an EU member. OK. Is that how you see it, Vaughan? No. But however you voted in the referenda, the reality is as it is now. The form of leaving the European Union that's been chosen does create extra burdens for businesses to trade with Europe. It isn't just a, the challenge around trade with Europe. We've actually seen a fall in trade with the loss of the, with the rest of the world as well, actually. Uh, and the challenge is whether or not we're going to see promises kept about what we were told would happen. So Dellis, right, the billion pounds we're going to lose, and Seb can tell you this as well, because his colleagues in the Financial Times confirmed that's the loss to Wales over the next few years. But it is more than that. The extra paperwork has a real, makes a real difference for businesses. When you see those giant lorry queues near Dover, that is as a result of having to fill out more declarations. It makes a big difference of how trade flows. It's not simply a matter of signing your name on a bottom of a piece of paper. It makes a real difference. And that puts people off from exporting and importing, and that affects jobs, businesses and investment here as well. I just wish we could have a bit more honesty about the reality of having left the European Union and being a third country. And rest of the word trail deals, I can tell you, I spoke to the Farmers Union of Wales today, not natural labour supporters, I can tell you, but I think they're desperately concerned about the trade agenda and the fact that George's government is happy to offer up agriculture as a make-weight in rest of the world trade deals that won't replace the challenge to our trade with the rest of Europe. Our biggest trading market is with Europe. Welsh land, we won't be able to export that in the same number still and to grow it, to Europe. Okay. The barriers that are put in place by George will make that much harder rather than easier for us Let me hear from the audience quickly, flourish. we haven't got that much more time. The woman in the black and white top. Basically, um, we had a party political broadcast earlier on this week by the Conservatives who said that actually Welsh farmers had much opportunities in sending Welsh lamb to Australia. I didn't, you know, I think Australia have got a few more sheep than we have. They have. They've got lots and the woman in the, in the turquoise cardi. I think poor old George is doing his best to tell us that it was a good idea to leave the European Union, but I can't think of a single benefit that has come out of it yet. And that's the thing, okay. that Jacob rees had to ask people, yeah. what do you think that the opportunities might yes. be, what, what, what the benefits are? And, and again, I'm afraid it's another example of Tory lies, because we were told we would be not a penny worse off. Instead, we're going to be a billion pounds yeah. worse off. I, 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 and, and this just, again, I think it erodes public it's trust. I didn't okay. see any of these things written on the side of a bus, no. did you? Sebastian. No. Well, my view on the opportunity, to use that word, is really 2016 was, for me, a cry from big parts of this country that they were not happy. 
They wanted change. They were not happy with their communities, their economic settlement, their social settlement, and they felt left behind, for want of a better phrase. And this is something um, that I've spent a lot of time and I've written a book about. And I went round the country, 6,000 miles over a year, and this was Mo this was all in England, but I think a lot of the problems you've seen in the Red Wall, those places that voted Conservative for the first time, you can see in Wales as well. And what we need for that is a comprehensive plan of how you're going to make the country more equal. And we've seen the levelling of white paper that came out um, um, very recently. It's been overlooked because of all the scandals engulfing the government. But for me, that was a fascinating piece of work. The first time you're looking across the country and saying, how can we try and address that need for change there? And I feel like the government has not quite taken that seriously. You know, it's 2016, it's quite a long time ago now since we voted to leave the EU. And yet, fundamentally, what has changed in terms of the structure of our society? What is the government doing for those kind of places? And George, you mentioned regulatory freedom, which I think is something. There are areas where we could do things differently, for example, in data or financial regulation. But it's two years since we've left the EU. Why are we just getting to this now? Well, we're not just getting to it. We've had an Agriculture Act, a Fisheries Act, uh, there's an Environment Act as well. Uh, all areas where we uh, are able now to chart a different course and a better course. And to actually um, come up with some creative policies in some of these areas. And that's just on my front. And we've got other uh, uh, similar Acts of Parliament that have gone through and given us those freedoms. And look, the reality is, uh, if you look at the economic performance of different uh, economies, uh, we have come out of the, the pandemic stronger than most, strongest growth in the G7. Um, we've now got 400,000 more people who are employed on payroll than we had at the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, we are uh, performing well as an economy, and some of that is down to the freedoms that we've got to be able to do things in our own way. But isn't okay, all of that just, just continuity? Just in terms of trying to keep things as similar as they are without looking at how you could do things quite differently. Sebastian, I'm just, I just want to hear a little bit more from the audience. We've only got about 30 seconds. The, the person at the very back. Yes, you've got your hand straight up. What have you got to say? <laughs> I keep hearing the word freedom, and that's lovely, but we are part of the world still. We've left for Brexit, and that's lovely, you know, that's, that's what we decided. But we haven't removed ourselves from the whole world, so it's not a freedom. We're not an independent nation, and the rest of the world is on its own. We have to still collaborate, so we have to still create policy where we can communicate. But where is that policy? Where is that new world that we are promised? Because but I'm you, not seeing it. You don't it. feel you're seeing it? No. All right, George, I know you probably like to come back. We are out of time, I'm afraid. For, well, forgive we've just me. just led COP26, which is a great example of the UK leading on the world stage. OK. Our hour is up, I'm afraid. We're out of time. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening. Thank you to the audience for coming here in Newport. Very good to see you all. And, of course, thank you at home for watching from Question Time in Newport. Bye-bye. Thank you.